Hey, have you ever wondered if your child's IEP is really helping? Today we're going to look at whether IEPs are helping or hindering your child. Welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Lisa Ann Day Garcia and I help you optimize you and your child's brain health so you can feel calm, focused, and productive every day. We all should love that. Um, I wanted to let you know that I have started a new podcast and it's called Restore, Reorganize, and Rewire, which you can see by clicking the podcast tab. And yes, I know it's a work in progress. You got to start somewhere, right? So if you're um, ready to level up the brain health of you and your family members, make sure you subscribe to this channel, to my podcast hit that notification bell, share. Uh, I'm just trying to get the word out. I just need everybody's help to do it. Okay, so today's topic is one that will hit home for many parents or maybe many parents who are watching these videos, which is the IEPs or Individualized Education Plans. Or maybe you're a parent of a, a really young child and you think, you either want, you know, maybe you think you suspect something and you don't, you know, they're not in school yet. So this is, might be very interesting for you too. So um, if your uh, child struggles with things like working memory, you know, dyslexia, learning disabilities, focus, attention, hyperactivity, then you've probably been told that an IEP is the best way to support them. Actually, um, there's an IEP and there's a 504 plan. In an IEP, the child actually has to qualify um, through testing with certain disabilities, like let's say speech. Um, every district does it different. Every state does it different. But um, but they have to have they have to meet like they have a problem with working memory or you know they uh, they get tested and then they fall below a certain criteria. And that criteria is different in wherever you are. If a child is just having, they, they don't meet that criteria, but they're falling below in school, they might just put them on a 504 plan, which is basically the teachers are saying, yeah, we'll kind of give them some extra support, but it doesn't exactly um, meet the IEP guidelines. So those are two different things. So usually kids who, let's say, with ADHD may um, find themselves getting a support through a 504 because they don't necessarily have a learning disability, but it's still preventing them from um, being successful in school. I was a learning specialist for a long time, so this is why I'm talking about this, and I was invited to a lot of IEP meetings. My son, who's 23, has been an on, was on an IEP his whole school career, um, I, I have a lot of pet peeves about it. Now, granted, every state has their way of doing it. Every district has their way of doing it. When we moved from Utah to um, overseas, because we, um, we lived on a military base, so it was um, U.S. public education. Um, so that's Dodea. Dodea has their way. So when we took our IEP over there, they were critical about the um, IEPs that were done here and they had to redo it. And when we brought, came back and we took that IEP over here, the people here were critical about the IEP over there. I mean, like everybody has their own kind of way of, um, of uh, doing it. So an IEP is supposed to provide individualized support to help your child succeed in school. And it might include accommodations like extra time on test or a program that addresses reading or math difficulties, or maybe speech and language, um, occupational therapy. In a lot of places, occupational therapy is an add-on, so you can't get it just for occupational uh, therapy, which would be like, um, like especially fine motor um, issues and sensory issues. Some uh, occupational therapists really focus on sensory, some don't. Um, uh, but, um, so, you know, when you, on the surface, it sounds really great. When you're a parent and you're going and you think you're going to get all this support, so it sounds really great, but in reality, um, what I have found is that these plans actually help 
kids compensate for their struggles rather than addressing the root cause of the struggles, which is why I'm no longer in the schools, okay? Because I, I had a real problem with that. Um, so what, so I'll just um, take you through this, you know, through the experiences that I have had. I have watched, so I, what we did is like, I was a math specialist. So I would get students and um, let's say I would get students who were not on an IEP because I was supposed to be a teacher that we were helping the students that didn't qualify for an IEP, but um, they were kind of like the middle band kids. They were kind of like the ones that could kind of fall through the cracks. So I would get students, I would watch them and I'd work with them. And then I go, you know, me and the teacher, we would talk and we would like, okay, yes, there's something more going on here. And the teacher would refer them for testing. So in this battery of tests, they would, um, we would first you'd have a meeting. So if you've never been through the process, first you would have a meeting with the parents and all the teachers involved and the administrators. And it's very, first of all, it's very intimidating. It can be very intimidating for the parent to be kind of ganged up on by all these professionals. Um, it depends. I mean, some schools, um, there might just be a couple, but where, where I was, it was kind of a battery of, of people. Then the first meeting is basically, okay, this is what we notice. Um, we think we should do testing. The parents is okay. So then they go do the testing. Then they have another meeting where they um, read the results of the test. Um, and the test might show um, working memory um, levels. Um, let's see. Uh, working memory, like short-term memory, long-term memory, a lot of memory stuff, um, processing, auditory processing, visual processing. Like they, they were assessing the kid to death. We, and you know, we all kind of know, like we all know like where the issue, there wasn't ever any surprise, but at least you're getting like a number, right? So you're getting some numbers. And then, um, then we say, okay, so now we are going to, um, we need to set and write a goal. So a lot of times that was another meeting or sometimes it was at the same meeting. And it's supposed to happen together with the parents, but usually what ends up happening is the um, administrator and the teachers, or at least in my experience, I'm just talking about from my experience, I've seen mostly where the um, the they pre you know because it can take a long time and you know otherwise you'll be sitting there all day so what the teachers do is they kind of come up with their own goals then they share it with the um with the parents and if the parent is savvy like i was an, an educator so when i went to my own son's iep i was able to highly contribute and say okay well let's do this and so our meetings actually ended up being longer and they were after school so i'm sure the teacher wasn't very happy but with a teacher who doesn't know, they're just like, okay, that sounds good to me. And um, so the teachers basically ended up coming up with all the goals. The parents, you know, might not really know what, you know, what else to do. So, um, so that's just kind of the way it ends up being. What I have found and, um, and me and like some of the teachers would get together and we would be so frustrated because the goal, so let's say the child has, is, scores 12% because in the day at the time, I don't know what it's like now. This is, I mean, I've been out for six years. At the time, I think you had to be under 12%. It was either under 20 or under 12. It was such a low number. It was pathetic because you're like, okay, what about the kids at 30%? 30% is like not functioning very well either okay so anyway you had to be really really low and um and let's say it was let's say the main things were working memory and auditory processing for example well what what's happening is that um the goals isn't to help with working memory in an auditory processing so you would think and this was and the thing is is i was kind of early in my brain study and, and I wasn't as bold and vocal as I should have been. Um, but you would think if the primary issue is working memory and auditory processing, then their goals should have some goals to um, work on working memory and auditory processing. Because believe it or not, 
you can fix those, right? They can be fixed. They can, um, that's why if you go to a learning center, that's what they're doing. They're trying to fix that, okay? Now, it might not be 100% fixed in everybody, but the, the brain is plastic and it can rewire. And so if you just um, give it the right um, experiences and the right drills for enough time, um, you can fix all that. So instead of doing that, they'll create goals like, okay, the teacher will give them less problems on a test or um, you know, they have to modify something for the child. So in the short run, that might be necessary, okay, to reduce some of that stress, to reduce, um, uh, to make, make the curriculum attainable to the child. You need to do some of that. And, and, but at the same time, um, so a lot of times what happens is these children go to, let's say an hour a day, two hours a day or whatever, they'll go to the, the special ed teacher to work on their goals. Well, if their their goals, let's say the um, let's say in math they're struggling in math, so they're having goals um, because they're in fourth grade and they're still stuck kind of in that first or second grade math. Okay, well that's legitimate, and the the special ed teacher needs to try to get the kid from point A to point B in mathematics. But at the same time, if the, if the problem is uh, auditory processing or working memory or whatever, there still should be goals that are focused on those specific deficits that the child is experiencing. Otherwise, what is going to happen? The child is gonna be stuck in the system for their entire career. Um, for on average, okay, some kids exit or whatever. Um, probably the kids that exit in a couple years is maybe because they have a special ed teacher who is a little bit more experienced and understands um, how to do kind of what I'm saying. But in general, if you if a child enters at third grade, because um, usually they enter the special ed program unless they're really severe around third grade because it takes like two or three years by the time the teachers can document and they say, well, let's wait and blah, 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 blah. Um, so they can go from third grade all the way to, I don't know, middle school, high school um, on an IEP and they don't usually exit or, um, or they don't, definitely don't exit fast enough. So if the IEP was actually focusing on fixing the problem, the child could exit in a year, you know, within that year. Like if, if it was like if they start in September. So let's say within 12 months. So they start in the middle of the year, by the middle of the next year, that they're, that kid, in, unless they are really involved, but if we're talking about the average child who is receiving special education and IEP, and I'm like totally on my soapbox right now, they can, they should be able to be exited in a year because if, if that child was receiving targeted, and I'm talking as a parent too, because this was something that I really wished was my child was experiencing. But if that child was receiving targeted um, interventions, to help correct the deficits and forget about the reading and forget about the math, forget about whatever. If they spent that, even if it was one hour a day, if they spent that one hour every day just targeting that, they could be, um, the average child receiving special services could probably exit within the year or even maybe six months. Um, I knew a uh, speech, she was a speech, I knew a speech teacher who didn't teach speech. I mean, she she had the goals, the kids maybe sort of worked on it. You know what she did? They did all the interventions that the brain needed to do for um, brain development. So I'm not saying that there's nobody out there doing it. I'm saying, by and large, your school is probably not doing it. And if you have a speech teacher or an OT who is working closely with your teacher to target brain development 
and brain, um, uh, you know, things that help make brain connections. And we're talking about things like movement therapies, um, vestibular, doing things like spinning, doing things like jump rope, things that you would think when you look at it is like play. In fact, I had I over a parent told me that she overheard one, another parent telling another parent, oh, that like in my, they were referring to my class because I had a pull-up program, that oh, those kids are just in there playing. But your brain, the way um, there are certain movements and that there are certain things that you can do to help that brain to connect. Um, working on drills, like working memory drills, working on things that um, just doing specific things, interactive metronome, the listening program. There's so many things out there um, that if you were to, um, because as a parent, what are you going to do? Well, you probably are going to have to go in your community and find a like a um, some kind of like learning RX or some kind of a, um, a learning program um, that is not in your schools. That could be in your schools. It could be. Your special ed teacher could learn all those things because I did. I learned all those things because my goal was to provide, I kept saying, I want to provide a $6,000 education for free in my public school. I was in Japan. The teacher, the parents did not have access to anything like that in the economy because in Japan, most people don't speak English. Okay, unlike a lot of other countries where, you know, there, a lot of professionals might speak English. In Japan, very few professionals speak English. So they don't have the access. So I wanted to be that access. Um, so anyway, that was totally unscripted and on my off my uh, soapbox. Um, so anyway, um, so my um, conclusion, basically, I'm just going to, I'll just wrap up because I like totally went... If your child's IEP has goals that just help them compensate for the problem, but does not have, include goals to help fix the problem, then that IEP is not doing them any service. It's letting the parents assume that things are being worked on and taken care of. Parents don't know. Um, you know, the average parent doesn't know. Um, and it's not doing anybody any service. It's keeping that kid in the system forever. And, um, and it's just letting that child access the curriculum, which we want them to do, but at the same time, we want to have, give that child the experiences it needs in order to, um, uh, in order to um, get over, to recover, to, um, you know, to completely function as every, like everybody else, right? We want them to get better. We want their memory to improve or we want their processing to improve. We want uh, whatever it is, we want it uh, to improve. So anyway, that is um, my, uh, my soapbox. And the problem is, is that I'm not, I'm not blaming the teachers because they don't know what they don't know. I taught in the university, in the teacher ed program. I mean, I taught math methods, but, um, excuse me, but um, I taught in the university. They're, they are not teaching teachers anything about brain development. Us teachers, we are in charge of growing brains, but we are not... Um, we are in charge of growing brains, but we don't know anything about brain development and how the brain grows. We just know how to shove a bunch of information into the kids' heads, and um, I mean, that's what we learn. We learn how to do that nice, but what happens is, is all that is way up here, and we don't know anything down here. It used to be 40 years ago, all the children would come to school with all this in place because there were no toxins. They played outside. They, um, you know, they had, a good nurturing environment, not that the home environment, but it's it's just that um, they didn't have all the technology. They they went outside. They did what their brain needed to do in order to grow, and they didn't have the toxins interfering with it. And they didn't have the technology interfering with it. Nowadays, the kids come with so many holes, um, and the teachers still are just putting in all the information um, on top of they're putting a roof. This is what I always say. 
they're building a roof on a house that barely had that they just have cardboard walls and the whole house is going to fall apart so i probably should make this as a podcast <laughs> because i totally went off a soapbox um but i really wanted to um talk about this is a, a very big pet peeve of mine and so hopefully if your child is on an IEP think a little bit more are his goals helping his the deficits improve um, because maybe maybe you're at a school maybe it's happening and if so count your blessings but if not you might want to think about okay now now what what do I need to do? Do I need to do something to make up for that? Do I need to go to the schools and say, hey, look, there's all these things that can be done. You know, maybe you can be an advocate for the teachers to point them in the way, in the right direction. Okay, I didn't have anybody. I just kind of found it by myself. So um, anyway, okay, I digress. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. Share it with other parents who might be struggling with the same concerns share it with your teachers okay i uh, i was an educator for 25 years i'm not bashing teachers i'm just saying teachers don't know what they don't know and i just wish there was a way for them to realize that there's a whole nother world out there that they don't even realize exists okay don't forget to subscribe for more tips on brain health, on learning, and drop a comment below if you've had experience with AM IEPs, what worked, what hasn't, if you have a question. Um, and if you um, want, I have a uh, link below to an ebook and a, a course bundle. It's a book course bundle. It's actually like, uh, it's not just an ebook, it's a book. It's a digital book, but it's a book book um, in course bundle, and it's on the five steps on how to um, for brain recovery. So you might want to check that out. And right now, um, we are on step um, on Mondays. We are working through the five pillars, those five steps, and we are um, going to be on inflammation for a few weeks. So catch our Monday thread. This is our Thursday thread where we talk about something a little bit deeper. All right, I will catch you later and thank you for watching.